Good evening, everyone. You're welcome to this service. This is the King Scott Bible Teaching, Prayer, and Leadership Development Service. Uh, we're going to be going into a series which will actually highlight the prayer aspect of this service. Uh, and it's titled Prayers from the Book of Acts. But before we start off, let's actually, you know, pray. Father, we give you praise. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege to be called sons of God by that which the Lord Jesus, your son, Yeshua, has done, even on the cross. We have been brought onto this grace that you have made available through his shed blood, through his broken body, and we are grateful for it. And we continue to thank you for the Holy Spirit that you've given us. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Teacher, guide, helper. Come, teach us. Unveil scriptures to us. Unveil the word of God to us. But beyond just the unveiling, internalize it. Cause it to be internalized within us. That it might bear fruit that brings glory to our Father. I pray for my brothers and sisters, everyone under the sound of my voice and those who will listen or watch this in time to come. Lord, that clarity is given, understanding, insight by the Spirit. The Lord, your name is glorified. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You're welcome again to the service. It is the King's Court Bible Teaching, Prayer, and Leadership Development Service. Today, we're going to start off a prayer series, and it's titled Prayers from the Book of Acts. Prayers from the Book of Acts. Before we start off, I quickly want to invite us to, uh, for those who are able to attend, <clears throat> our prophetic watch service. Uh, coming up on December 31st, 2021, it's a Friday. Uh, we do this every year, of course, but it's not just the usual, you know, like people would say, crossing over into a new year, of course, a Gregorian calendar year, but it's also a prophetic watch in the sense that we posture ourselves, of course, before that day in such a way that we, you know, we listen to the spirit for what he might say or reveal concerning the, the year to come, concerning the season. Um, you know, of course, God is not bound to human calendars, but God has his own calendars uh, and the things that he has set by his own power. So we just want to position ourselves to, you know, to receive from him. And on that day, uh, uh, there's a release of, of that. And over the years, we've seen powerful words, powerful insights come out of both biblical text and prophetic, you know, revelation and vision and insight. So for those who are in the Chicago area, the address is there, 8500 South Carpenter. Uh, the doors will open at 9. Service will begin at 9.30. And uh, we're going to be leaving there at 12.30, of course, in the new Gregorian calendar year. So again, you're invited entering into the new year with thanksgiving and praise. All right, so let's go into the message for today. We just completed a 15 session course of study in the book of Acts. And for our audiences and those who might be watching this, you know, seeing us for the first time, you can actually have uh, access to those, uh, you know, lessons, 15 session lessons or course of study in the book of Acts. And we think they are very insightful. We think that you know, they, they reveal quite a lot uh, that pertains to our work with God. So if you want to have them, reach out to us. It's free of charge. You can find it on Facebook. You can also find it on YouTube. So again, we found much insight in the book of Acts that is relevant to the agenda of God uh, in general, relevant to the facts and principles of our faith, our Christian faith, and also as guidelines for the church and for service in the kingdom of God. Powerful truths we discovered in the book of Acts. Now, one of the insights is found in the writer's opening statement itself. The writer's opening statement in Acts chapter 1 verse 1 reveals that the book is a treatise and it's about the deeds and teachings of Jesus Christ, of the former uh, treatise I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. So we can tell from that statement alone that the writer made a case because a treatise is like making a case, like a prosecutor prosecuting a case 
you know, deducing facts and principles of a subject matter. And in this case, the subject matter is the Christian faith. So the writer made a case for the facts and principles of our faith. And again, I keep saying this, I said it before, that that then means to us that we must go back to look at those things that the writer presented as facts and principles of our faith, not just facts in terms of historical facts, but principles, guidelines that we can also live by. One area where some of the principles do apply is the area of prayer. And that is what leads into our, uh, the series we're gonna be looking at uh, beginning from today. So as should be expected, the coming of the Holy Spirit not only filled the disciples and the apostles of Jesus Christ with power from above, remember Jesus promised that, that they were gonna be filled with power from above after the Holy Spirit had come on them. But we now found out not only were they actually filled with power from above through the Holy Spirit, their lives were literally transformed. The coming of the Holy Spirit, the infilling of the Holy Spirit literally transformed their lives. And when you're talking about their lives, we're talking about their worldview. Their worldview was transformed. Remember, we saw cases they used to believe in a certain way that, you know, God had nothing to do with Gentiles, but the Holy Spirit came and transformed that perspective and caused them to understand that the door of salvation had been opened to the Gentiles, which, by the way, is how you and I came in. But it also transformed their posture. People who at one time were serving different, you know, uh, uh, um, causes in life now turned around and focused on this thing, this kingdom advancement to the degree that, you know, when, when complaints came from some of the parish owners, somebody like Simon could boldly say, you know, guys, we're not going to be serving tables and leave the word and prayer. So they found out that this is our new posture. This is our new, the new life we've received. It also transformed their conviction. We can see that many times they came before the leaders of the day who strictly and sternly warned them about preaching you know, the name of Jesus, but they were, they, they, their conviction was so strong. They said, you judge, who should we rather obey, God or man? And for those of us who know the story very well, most of them died holding on to their faith. They didn't, they didn't deny their faith. So we can tell a strong conviction was you know, enacted or activated by the coming of the Holy Spirit. It transformed their speech. People who used to talk in a certain way now, everything they were saying was all pertaining to the advancement of the kingdom of God, you know, but also more particularly to today's message, it transformed their prayer patterns. It, the, the coming of the Holy Spirit, the infilling of the Holy Spirit transformed the prayer patterns of these disciples and apostles of Jesus. So saints of God, what are we saying? We cannot leave that area out. You know, we talk about, we've talked about the Holy Spirit in so, many, in so many areas, how he transforms so many areas of our lives. But one of the critical areas the Holy Spirit wants to transform is our prayer lives. Our prayer patterns must indeed become transformed by the infilling of the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, it's one of the signs that shows that not only have we received the Holy Spirit, but we are actually yielded to the Holy Spirit. The same can happen for us just as it happened for them as well. <clears throat> now let's talk about the prayer life of the disciples of Jesus Christ before the infilling of the Holy Spirit. That might actually help uh, some of our audiences to see the, the sharp differences between who they were before the Holy Spirit and who they became after the Holy Spirit in terms of their prayer lives or prayer patterns. So no doubt about it, we can all agree that prayer is an integral part of our worship to God. So there's prayer towards God as a part of our worship. A lot of people think prayer is just about getting stuff, just to get stuff. Give me, give me, give me. Do for me, do for me, do for me. But, but prayer, first and foremost, is our report to duty. It's our responsibility, God word. It's, a, it's an integral part of our worship. There is what you call prayers of worship, prayers of adoration, not prayers of asking and receiving, just worshiping God, you know, being in his presence, acknowledging him for who he is and what he has done. That's prayer also. And that should actually be the first posture of prayer. So prayer is an integral part of our worship to God. It's also an integral part of our service in his kingdom. 
And I know a lot of believers are not in that aspect of service. A lot of believers just come to receive from God, but we are called to service. The Bible calls us co-laborers with Christ, which, which means that we serve in God's kingdom. Prayer then takes on another you know, perspective. It becomes an integral part of our service in his kingdom. How do you serve God if you do not know what he wants you to do? How do you stay afloat in these ever-changing trends of life? How do you stay online with the Holy Spirit constantly in the midst of chaotic disorder? How do you stay intact with God if not through prayers? And of course, prayer is also integral in our daily lives on earth. As life throws things at us, as we encounter things in lives, Prayer becomes a place where we find both wisdom, strength, fortitude in some cases to bear certain things, and you know, strength to overcome and to scale through, to remain standing. The Bible says, having done all to stand, stand therefore. And that is done through the power and the efficacy of Holy Spirit-inspired prayers. Now, through prayers, of course, like we said, we commune with God our Father. Through prayers, we stay online with the Holy Spirit in our kingdom service. Speaking of staying online, we're in a digital age, and I think most of us understand what that is. To so stay online all the time, to receive, you know, it's like to stay connected with a network, to stay connected with the Holy Spirit. We do that through prayer. But also, we engage life on earth through prayer. Like I said, again, when life throws things at us, we engage life through prayer. Now, many believers and church folks talk about, you know, prayer as something that is boring. As a matter of fact, the least attended service today, any church person can tell you or any minister can tell you, is prayer service. And a lot of churches are beginning to shift away from that because it is least attended. And so, you know, especially if you're a minister who is... Uh, you know, ignited by the, the presence of a crowd. There's what you call crowd, uh, 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 you know, crowd uh, motivation, something that some people are motivated just by looking at the crowd. So if you're that kind of a minister who's motivated by the fact that you're surrounded by a crowd of people, well, and, and, and you, you're one who wants to organize prayer services and people don't attend, you might get to the point where you're discouraged and you don't want to do that anymore. You rather want to lean towards what people find appealing but we must understand that, you know, people who shy away from prayers or find, you know, find it hard to, to, to be willing or hardly find willingness to pray or even delight in prayer, that sense of God is an indication that something is not right. You know, just like in our normal lives, when you're, when you're running temperature, when you're feeling somehow, some kind of way, your immune system lets you know, okay, something is not right. The truth of the matter is that when you don't feel elated, you don't feel delighted about prayers, and you don't feel a willingness. David said, I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. And yes, the house of the Lord, you know, entails so many things, including praise, including worship, including fellowship, including all the other good stuff, but also including prayer. Uh, we, we also remember in the book of Acts, we're told that they continue daily in the apostles' doctrines and prayer. So prayer is critical. It's foundational to our walk with God, foundational to our, to our faith, to the Christian faith. So for us to be one, or for anyone to be one who professes to be of Christ and yet finds prayer, you know, abhorrent or, or finds prayer something to, to, to shy away from, that becomes an indication that, you know, something is wrong. There's an ailment somewhere. I also dare say that it's, in, it's indicative of the fact that we're not totally yielded to the Holy Spirit. And you're going to find that as we proceed. You know, no offense, but it's just true. Because the Holy Spirit is, is a spirit of prayer. The Holy Spirit ignites prayer. It's a spirit of passion. It's a spirit that in, it inspires fervency in prayer. So to have the Holy Spirit and not be one who is delighted to pray shows that there's a disconnect. That doesn't mean you don't have the Holy Spirit. It just means there's a disconnect. You're not fully yielded to the leadership of the Holy Spirit because he really wants to lead us into the place of prayer, to the place of you know, being obedient to the Lord Jesus. And also people who shy away from that are actually missing out on an integral and critical element of our faith walk. 
it's very critical. It's very, as a matter of fact, dangerous to not be a person of prayer. And I'm talking about spirit-inspired prayers. The Holy Spirit inspires fervency in praying, like I was saying earlier. <clears throat> and we're going to find this in the lives of the disciples and the apostles of Jesus Christ following the infilling of the Holy Spirit. So again, but first, let us go back to their previous life before the infilling of the Holy Spirit to see what, what sort of people they were. What was their prayer lives like before they received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? Luke chapter 11, verse 1, without going into too many uh, a scriptural texts, Luke chapter 11, verse 1, reveals a snapshot of the disciples' level of spiritual maturity when Christ met them. And by the way, I say spiritual maturity because prayer is an indication of spiritual maturity. Uh, I know that's hard for some people to receive, but that is true. You know, if, you, if, we, if we are not in a place where we commune with God, because that's what really prayer is about, where we fellowship with the spirit of Christ, then how do you say you're mature? How, how can one say I'm mature in the things of God? What, how do you determine maturity? Or oh, because you attend services, you don't fail, or oh, you don't come late to church, or oh, you give, you give. So, no, but those are not signs of maturity. The sign of maturity is that you're growing in the knowledge of Christ. The signs of maturity is that you are fully yielded. So it is more of Christ and less of flesh. It is more dedication, more yielded to, to the will of God rather than, you know, self-will or rather than being self-directed or directed by the ways of the world. And where does that happen, saints of God? It happens in the, in the place of prayer. I'm quickly reminded of Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. That's where it happens. That's where there's a contention between the flesh and the spirit. That's where there's a contention between self-will and complete obedience to God. Not my will but your will be done. So in Luke chapter 11, verse one, the Bible says once Jesus, and, and, and this is, I believe, a New Living Translation, once Jesus was in a certain place praying, as he finished, one of his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. <laughs> so we get a few things, or a few points from this text. A few points come out of this text. The number one is that Jesus was given to prayers. So this is an indictment to ministers who criticize prayer. And I get it. Some people can get into religious and traditional prayers and yet ignore. And my, my philosophy is this, and also supported by scriptures. You cannot truly really pray by the spirit and not be one who is activated to, to do something. Because prayer reveals the will of Christ. Prayer reveals the will of the Father. And so the will of the Father becomes your will. So prayer now, so the first thing prayer does is reveal the will of the Father. And once the will of the Father is known, then prayer becomes a force to humble ourselves, to set flesh aside. Now, when flesh is set aside and we are now aligned to the revealed will of God, then prayer now takes on the posture of enforcing that will of God on the earth. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But between those two, the will of God in heaven being done on earth, people have to first know that will of God, receive that will of God, align themselves to that will of God, then enforce that will of God on planet earth. So you can see what there is to be done. There is work to be done. So you can't say, I'm just praying just pray, just pray, just pray, just pray, just pray. No work done, nothing done, no obedience carried out, <clears throat> no revealed will of God, no direct instruction of the Spirit. Just pray, 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 pray. Then it becomes a mon monotonous, robotic exercise that, that you know, leads nowhere. Prayer is to reveal and know the will of God and then to align ourselves to that will and then to carry out that will of God on the earth. So again, as I was saying, ministers who criticize prayer, I don't think that's the right thing to do. Rather, let's take God's people to the next level to understand after praying, of course, it's got to be spirit-inspired prayers because if not, it's just traditional prayers. So Jesus was given to prayers and he's our master. He's our example. He's the one we're following after. And he was given to prayers. That scripture says one of the times he prayed, so he was one given to prayers. 
And if he was, then we should also. But the next thing we find in that text is that interestingly, Jesus did not impose this prayer lifestyle on his disciples. I, I thought that was interesting. I mean, his disciples were just, in fact, he never told them, okay, guys, come, kneel down, pray, let's pray. And, you know, we get into legalism and we do that. You know, a lot of leaders want to enforce it on their members. You must pray. You got to, you know, if you don't pray, you're the devil and stuff like that. But Jesus didn't do that. Now, the question is why? I think it is because he knew, number one, the Holy Spirit is required to do this. And these people don't have the Holy Spirit yet. And number two, he knew the Holy Spirit would do, you know, would lead them into that place of prayer eventually, according to the plan of God. I remember when uh, disciples of John came to him and, you know, a little bit of criticized him for not uh, teaching his disciples to fast. Of course, along with fasting comes prayer. And Jesus said, you know, why would they fast and pray when they have the master of the house with them? So he, he, he said, the days are coming when they're truly going to do that, when the master is gone. So he knew he could see into the future plans of God that this was going to be taken care of by the Holy Spirit after his departure. But it's interesting to me, he didn't force them. And here is another reason we must uh, uh, come to terms with. When we do things out of the flesh, or when we do things out of legalism, when we do things outside of the Holy Spirit, it's hardly that it ple- it's hard that it pleases God. Uh, it doesn't hit the target. It doesn't hit the mark. So rather, we must engage people or get people to engage with the Holy Spirit first and foremost, rather than just being religious about things. <clears throat> the third thing we see from that text again is that the prayers of Jesus were different from what the disciples were used to. I mean, they could tell there was something. If, if Jesus' prayers were like they had been praying, then there was no need for them to pay attention. There was no need for them to say, oh, Jesus, we see something about your prayer. There's something unique about your prayer. Can you teach us how to pray like you do? Just the same way John taught his disciples. You know, it caught their attention. So there was something unique about the prayer of Jesus. The next thing we see then is that they knew there was a lesson to learn on how to pray like Jesus. So however Jesus prayed, you know, uh, uh, registered to the disciples, that okay, we we need to learn that. (laughs) There's something about this that we need. We need this. And that's beautiful. I I just thought that was interesting. But the next thing we also see here is that they refer to John. They said John also taught his disciples how to pray, which is interesting. So it would seem to me that anyone called of God would pray. So John also was given to prayers. So you wouldn't say it's just a New Testament reality. And of course, if we go into the details of that, when we go back to the Old Testament, everyone God called prayed. Everyone prayed. Everyone prayed. Abraham prayed. You know, Jacob prayed. Isaac prayed. Elijah prayed. The prophets would pray unto God. And here we see John prayed. And of course, we've seen Jesus prayed also. So there is no excuse, child of God, no excuse, minister of God. Rather than making excuses, let us follow the pattern of God that is revealed in the word of God so we can become a people of spirit-inspired prayers. John also was given to prayers. But not only, did John, uh, not only was John given to prayers, he actually taught his disciples how to pray. What does that say? It says to us as leaders, and as ministers, that we must also teach our people how to pray. The disciples came to Jesus to ask him to teach them. And Jesus didn't say, no, I can't teach you or you're not supposed to be taught. He actually taught them how to pray. So if they were also saying that John taught his disciples to pray, it then meant that before John came, (laughs) nobody had it right. (laughs) If John had to teach, then it meant nobody was doing it right. And I was going to talk about the dark ages before the coming of Jesus Christ, but I didn't want to bore us with all of that. The next thing we see in this text is that John and his disciples were actually the standard for the disciples on how to pray. Say, just like John taught his disciples. So they knew if you're not a disciple of John, you probably weren't going to be taught how to pray. So they were like outcasts. But then when they saw Jesus praying, it ignited something in them. And they said, teach us how to pray. Saints of God, if you don't know how to pray, you can also ask to be taught how to pray. Uh, To just let it, you know, just just die a natural death is not the way to go. We must pray. And if we don't know how to, let's be taught how to pray. There is a way to pray. 
there is a way to pray kingdom prayers. That is something else we also see there. But also in the book of Matthew 26 and verse 40, we see that even at the end of Jesus' ministry in the flesh, the disciples had not yet caught the critical significance of prayer. And for me, this is so telling. This is so telling that even towards the end of the, you know, the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ, the disciples had not yet caught the relevance, the significance of prayer. But not only as a matter of time sequence or chronology, but also this critical moment that Jesus found himself in. It, it's there, Matthew 26, verse 40. said, then Jesus came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And then he said to Peter, to Simon, what? Could you not watch with me one hour? So we see here that at a very critical moment, of course, you know what's going on here. The Lord Jesus knew that his time of, you know, ordeal with death his dealing and his, 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 you know, the time of his departure, but of course going to be a gruesome experience, was about to unfold, was about to, you know, happen. And he was in deep sorrow, he was in deep pain of the spirit. You would think that at such a critical moment of his life, those who had been with him for at least the last three years should at least catch a sense of that. But they did not. And that is truly, truly telling. It tells me the state of the disciples, even up until this time, with respect to spiritual maturity and prayer. So a few things we see there. One, without the spirit saints of God, our strength is no match for the things that mitigate against our spiritual walk. First and foremost, we must understand there are things that mitigate against our spiritual walk. Our spiritual walk is not an automatic ride. It's not, a, it's not an autopilot. We're dealing with the world. We're dealing with the enemy out there. Uh, you know, the Bible, James tells us, you know, that he, he goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So there's a such criteria. He's seeking whom he may devour. You must fall within that such criteria before he can actually devour. And I dare say to you that prayer is one way to stay above the such criteria of the enemy. For those who do not pray, they fall pray, do, do not pray, P-R-A-Y, they fall pray, P-R-E-Y, to the enemy. You can see, even at such a critical moment in the life of Jesus Christ and in his ministry, these guys went to sleep. They were asleep. So in other words, they were not bothered one bit. It didn't even affect them. They were not touched one bit, and that is not good at all. The next thing we see there is that although Jesus was in a state of heightened spiritual awareness, he still did not impose on his disciples. And I thought, wow, Lord Jesus, that's something we must learn. You know, even though he was face to face with death, it was death was staring him at the face and was getting ready to go through a, a, a terrible ordeal. Yet he did not impose. He didn't say, okay, guys, come and join me and pray. But, you know, some of us do that. Once anything happens, we want to bring the whole world in, including people who don't even know how to pray and so on and so forth. And even as ministers, I think this is something we can learn from. Sometimes we go through our period of Jacob's, Jacob's trouble. We must learn to really, really, really get ourselves into the arms of God. If God inspires others to pray, praise the Lord for that. <clears throat> but, you know, to bring others in who are not at the same spiritual sensitivity, the same level of spiritual awareness, may actually dampen things, may actually take you on a different tangent, but Jesus knew that this was his ordeal. Jesus knew this was a cross he had to bear, and he went through it all alone with the Spirit. He didn't actually bring this in. But I don't know if you read that text, uh, he told them, okay, it's enough. You can, you can rest, go and sleep. But then he told them, you must pray, because if you don't, you will fall into temptation. They pray that you do not fall into temptation. The next thing we see there is the fact that the disciples could not discern the time and season they had walked into is very, very telling. Prayer, sensitivity in the spirit enables us to be able to come to some degree of discernment of the times and seasons that we live in. The Bible speaks about, you know, uh, Israel, that they did not know the time and the season of their visitation. May we not be like them who do not know the time of our visitation. May we not be like them to not know when we have come into a season of heightened awareness, a season that calls for vigilance, a season that comes for, 
determination, a season that comes for heightened focus. Can you imagine uh, going back to the story of Elijah and Elisha? The prophets, the sons of the prophets were the ones telling Elisha, do you know God is about to take your master away from you? And he would tell them, hold your peace. You know, so, you know, there are people who boast in prophetic, what they can see prophetically. Oh, God, the thought says the Lord, I'm seen in the spirit. I just received word. Elijah is about to go. Elisha, your, your master is about to be taken. But Elisha shows us another, another dimension of the prophetic. He said, guys, hold your peace. I've gone past that level. I already know he's going to go, but I'm going beyond that level. I've got to be focused. I've got to understand the times and seasons because Elijah had told him, what you have asked for me is great indeed, but it can only happen if you see. It can only happen if you're able to discern the moment. It can only happen if you're able to, to, you know, to, to, to understand the, the times, the shifting times of the spirit. That is beyond just prophetic utterances, beyond just, you know, just knowing that events are going to happen. A lot of ministers thumb their chest and boast in being able to tell events, you know, read people's numbers and stuff like that. But there are deeper dimensions of the spirit, saints of God, the ability and the discernment of the spirit to know the shifting times and seasons, not only of what Satan is doing, but also what the spirit is doing. That is critical. Now, these disciples didn't know any of that. They went to sleep. You cannot come into a state of spiritual, heightened spiritual awareness and go to sleep. It doesn't happen. The spirit will awaken you. I mean... <laughs> And no need to talk about personal experiences, but, but these things happen. The Holy Spirit will wake you up in the middle of the night, awaken you to, you know, things happening in the, in, the, in, in the area, waking you up to spiritual activity. And you're going to find that sleep just goes away and you get into a state of prayer. But these guys went to sleep. In fact, the next thing we see here is the fact that the disciples uh, in the end scattered. They were scattered. They ran and left Jesus to his own, you know, fate. They could not wait. They could not, because they were not prepared. They were not ready for what was to come. And that fulfilled the words of Jesus. They pray that you do not fall into temptation. So when the enemy comes against us like a flood, if we do not have discernment, both to know the times and seasons, the shifting times and seasons, but to also be equipped in our spirit man to be able to push back the enemy, we could find ourselves like the disciples, turn our backs and run or flee before the enemy. May that not be our portion in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen to that. Now, let's begin to talk about the prayer lives of the disciples and apostles after they received the indwelling of the Spirit. We've seen what they, what they were like before the Holy Spirit came. Now, let's begin to talk about, you know, their prayer lives, how it was transformed after they received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Now, we're going to see that there's a dramatic transformation that happened in the lives of Jesus' disciples and apostles, of course, after they received the indwelling of the Spirit. And, you know, just thinking about it, this makes me wonder for people who relegate or deny the Holy Spirit. I just wonder where you are. I just wonder what happens. You know, you're going to have to rely on your intellect. You're going to have to rely on on, on intuition, like some people would say, you're going to have to rely on human ability, you know, human connections, human reasoning. And I'm going to show us as we proceed that that could be very dangerous. But here in Acts chapter 2 and verse 4, the Bible says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Observe again the word all, non exempt, non exempt, all filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't want to leave no one behind. So it's not a matter of, oh, it's only for apostles, or it's only for Pentecostals, or it's only for Charismatics. No, Roman Catholics, God wants to fill you with the Holy Spirit. Presbyterians, God wants to fill you with the Holy Spirit. Methodists, God wants to fill you with the Holy Spirit. Everyone, God wants to fill with the Holy Spirit. That is what Job prophesied. In the latter days, it shall come to pass, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh non-exempt. So don't exclude yourself, child of God, because of the denomination you belong to, because they don't believe in it, they don't teach it, and that is not according to the word of God. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. But observe, they began. Again, I like to emphasize that. They began. So in other words, it wasn't there before. They weren't doing it before. For the first time, they began 
And so we can, we can say, and we know it was because they were filled with the Holy Spirit, something new began. Something for the first time started to happen. They began to speak in tongues that were inspired by the utterance of the Holy Spirit. So which means before now, they were only speaking from their senses, speaking from their flesh, speaking from you know, surrounding realities and factors. But now the Holy Spirit brought a new reality that is beyond and above what may anything else. So again, we must learn from that. It's not what is happening around the world, it's what the Spirit is inspiring. What utterance is the Spirit giving? It's not what the situation is, it is what is the Spirit uttering. What utterance is the Spirit giving? It's not how I feel, it is what is the Spirit uttering. It's not what the world is saying, but what even Satan is saying. A lot of times church folks are motivated to pray because of what Satan has said or what Satan will do. But well, welcome to a new level of prayer where our prayer only comes from that which is uttered or inspired by the Holy Spirit. What a powerful place to be at. So we see that the infilling of the Holy Spirit activated a consciousness of urgency in the disciples. If you go back to that text, the Bible says suddenly. What that tells me is that so they were busy doing other things. And of course, if you read chapter one, you see that that is true. They were busy minding other business. And suddenly, without warning, without their expectation, without any forewarning, the Holy Spirit came. So and as soon as the Holy Spirit came, observe, whatever else they were doing was put on hold. It's like the Holy Spirit now became the, 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 the warning focus literally took over. So if they were, can you imagine, I, I, and I, I got to say this because a lot of times we've, we've, in church folks will fall into this. So can you imagine, assuming Simon was chit chatting with, with Andrew, for instance, and they were talking about news of the day, what the Pharisees were doing, the politics of the day, what the military people were doing, oh, family is saying, and then the Holy Spirit comes, the sound from heaven happened, and then the Holy Spirit comes, you think they're going to be still chatting and talking about politics and talking about family and talking about whatever it was? No, the Holy Spirit now became the focus. What does that say to you, child of God? When you come into the presence of the Lord, especially if you're filled with the Spirit of God, activate the Spirit. You now have come into the business of the Lord. And like David will say, the king's business requires haste. So you've had six days plus in doing worldly affairs, all the affairs of the world, talk politics, talk finances, talk whatever you want to talk, and it's perfectly okay. But that moment when you come into the presence of the Lord, why don't you give it to him? Why don't you just turn your focus, your, your, your attention wholly to the Holy Spirit? Everything else was shut down. The Holy Spirit became the one in focus. That is so active. That is so powerful. So they, they, they now saw a sense of urgency. The spirit is here. I can be chit-chatting. The spirit is here. I can be doing something else. The spirit is here. Let's connect to the spirit. But also observe, there was a focus. There was a focus. Nobody was looking at anybody else. Nobody had time for anything else. And that comes to one. Some of us, when we get into the place of prayer, we get easily distracted. Don't do that. I actually think that's an insult to the Holy Spirit. Because if the Holy Spirit was coming to be with you and being activated, and then all of a sudden you just shut down without warning. I think if something comes, listen, saints of God, these things are real. Um, we must understand that we're in tr truly in a relationship with the Holy Spirit. If you have to stop the prayer, take permission. Holy Spirit, give me one moment. That is reverence. Isn't that what the Bible says? Isn't that what the Bible says? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The reverence of the Lord. There's got to be reverence. When we come into his presence, we come with holy awe. We come with reverence. But, you know, we, we treat the Lord God with so much levity and, you know, uh, 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 nonchalance. And that's not right. If you have to take for me, maybe somebody's knocking at the door or some, just like as I'm here, if anything were to happen in the house now, I got to say, guys, give me one minute. Let me go take care of something. So can you imagine if I just get up and walk away and then come back and continue from where I left of that? <laughs> Some people will say that's rude. But we do that to the Holy Spirit. We do that to the Lord God. And I say we repent from that and stop doing that from henceforth. There was a focus. There was a focus. 
they began to speak in tongues. They didn't say, okay, well, let me call somebody, pick up the phone. And no, not, not now. But also observe there was a unity, a unity in and of the spirit. A unity because everyone got enraptured by the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's unity. And by the way, let me say why this is critical. It is the only place where we find unity. You're not going to find unity in doctrines. You're not going to find unity in your high-sounding revelation. <laughs> you know, we too, we have revelation. But I've come to find that unity is not found in revelation. Because one man understands a particular scripture one way, the other person sees it another way. The only place we find unity is when we all come into the spirit. And he has his way. He fills us all and he flows through us. Then there's unity of the spirit, which is what Paul actually said. The next thing we see that there was fervency in the activity. There was no yawning and scratching and wanting to go. There's no, there was passion. Everybody was into it. There was fervency in the activity. As a matter of fact, proof of this is the fact that they were no longer afraid of the people that we are afraid of in the first place. Because they had come into a place where it's like even the fear was drowned. And I dare say to you, child of God, if you find your place in a situation where you are afraid, that is when to activate the fervency of the spirit. Because the spirit of fear will depart as the Holy Spirit takes a hold of you. They were no longer afraid. They came out from the upper room and came out to the audience because they had been empowered by the Holy Spirit. But there was also sustained frequency. It's not pray for two minutes, oh, I'm tired, let's go do something. No, it was sustained. They just kept going. They just kept going. It was now the Holy Spirit in control. When we pray Spirit-inspired prayers, that is when you find that you pray longer. That is when you find that you pray because the burden of the Lord comes upon you. The burden of the Spirit comes upon you. The Holy Spirit now begins to use you as a vocal uh, instrument to, to express the burden, the desires of the Spirit. And my God, Paul says there are groanings that cannot be altered by mere human flesh and human words. It was sustained frequency. But then the Bible tells us how this all happened. The Holy Spirit filled them and the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. So child of God, we must also follow the same. It should be our desire to be filled with the Holy Spirit and our desire to receive utterance of the Holy Spirit even in prayer. Yes, even in prayer. So let's begin to talk now about first prayer from the book of Acts. The first prayer from the book of Acts. Now, it is worthy of mention that the writer of the book of Acts did record that the disciples and the apostles of Jesus Christ prayed in the upper room before the infilling of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> That's interesting. They prayed before. So somebody can say, oh, but they were praying. Okay, fine. Yeah, they prayed before the Holy Spirit. And you can find it in Acts chapter 1 verse 14. Uh, the first one, there's another reference. We'll get to it. Acts 1.14, it said, These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the woman. And of course, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. All right. And then the next one, it continued in verse 24 of the same Acts of the 1, 24 to 26. And they prayed and said, you, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen, 25, to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. Verse 26, and they cast their lots, and the Lord fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. All right, so very quickly, what you find out here is that these prayers had no Holy Spirit input <laughs> in them, unfortunately. It was prayers, yes, but it had no Holy Spirit input in them. And listen, saints of God, this is the beautiful thing about scriptures. The Bible tells us just the way it is. It's not trying to sugarcoat. It's not trying to blanket. It's not trying to uh, 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 embellish and stuff. No, it just, truth by its very nature is truthful. Truth gives truth just the way it is, as raw as it is, you know. And, and that's one beautiful thing about scripture. So, you know, we find out here the prayers were not spirit, uh, spirit inspired. 
and had no Holy Spirit input in them. As a matter of fact, these prayers were rooted in traditional mindsets and also with inhuman reasoning. We're going to prove it soon. <clears throat> Observe that immediately after the prayer in verse 14, although no text was given for whatever they prayed in verse 14, which is also indicative of the fact that the author didn't consider it anything of worth to write, or I don't know, I mean, but it just wasn't written, okay? But look at that, immediately after that prayer that was mentioned in Acts 14, Simon got into his impulsive nature. Acts 1 verse 16, men and brethren, Simon said, this scripture had to be fulfilled, had to be fulfilled, had to, had to. Question is, by who told you that, Simon? And yeah, you're correct, but how does God fulfill scriptures? It had to be fulfilled, yes, but how is it going to be fulfilled? I mean, do you have the power to fulfill scriptures? Who fulfills scriptures? And sometimes we get into that uh, uh, situation ourselves. But then Simon didn't stop there. Then he proceeded to his own human reasoning. Follow me now. Acts chapter 1, verse 21 to 22, he continues. Therefore, of these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, uh, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these, watch this, must become a witness with us of his resurrection. <laughs> Do you know that if we were to go by this criteria that Simon gave, Paul is totally disqualified. Paul could not even come anywhere close to becoming a witness of Jesus. So we can tell this was human reasoning. This was, and, and don't forget, human reasoning can be very good. It can sound like sound judgment. As a matter of fact, considering all factors, it might be the way to go. But this is why it is dangerous to go with human reasoning. As a matter of fact, what is flesh? Flesh is human reasoning outside of the Holy Spirit. Human reasoning without the input of the Spirit. Human reasoning can look very good, can sound very good, can sound like the right thing to do. All factors considered. But remember, if it's all factors, then one factor is the Holy Spirit. Make sure you consider that one too. But without the Holy Spirit, it is all flesh. Don't forget, your flesh includes your five senses. It includes your reason. It, it includes the five compartments of your soul. The will, I will, I will. You know, the emotions, how you feel. The intellect, how you've been taught. The memory, things coming from the past. Imagination, what you can perceive or what visions you can cast. And suffice it to say that a lot of times, even ministers of God get caught in this web of deception because our imagination casts visions for us and we quickly say it's of God, but we have not sought the input of the Holy Spirit. That's Simon giving his human reasoning. And this, like I said, would have disqualified uh, Paul, who we know eventually was the one the Holy Spirit chose. So, but then in this stuff there, still continue, they now sealed it in self-imposed authority, only seeking God's approval of their wishes. That's what we do. We do that, most of us do that today. We come up with our own self-imposed decisions and we say, God, just rubber stamp it. God grant it. Do it now, God. Do it now, God. This is what I want. You said you will give us whatever we desire. You said whatever we ask. It's all about us. So all we are asking is the Holy Spirit, just come and agree with what we have agreed upon. Just come and do what we want you to do. How about asking God what he wants done? How about asking the Holy Spirit, how should this be done? And taking the, 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 the back seat and let the Holy Spirit drive. Look at Acts chapter 1 verse 23. They proposed. So they proposed to, not the Holy Spirit inspired. They proposed to, and then they now prayed and said, you, O Lord, who knows the hearts of all men, show which of these two, who says it has to come from those two? <laughs> show which of these two you have chosen. So Holy Spirit, we've given you two persons. Your decision must come from those two. That's self-imposed authority. And yet the thing was, we'll come to that. And this, we do this a lot. We do this a lot. Oh, I take authority. You know, you can say that. But the question is, whose authority is that? And who gave you that authority? If you don't have a distinctive encounter and experience where the Lord Jesus or the Holy Spirit says, you have been empowered to do this, 
child of God, you do not have such authority. And that's why one other way to know that our flesh is driving most of our prayers is, the, again, that very word, I. I, 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 all this I, 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 I. It's you doing it. It's you doing it. But how about the Holy Spirit? How about Holy Spirit grant? Holy Spirit, you know, let this be. If you go back to the, the Father's own uh, declarations in the book of Genesis, let there be. He didn't say I do. Or, no, let there be. A word of, of, of command, a word issued from his presence. And that's how it happens. Even when Jesus prayed, you saw he didn't take, uh, 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 he didn't impose authority on himself. Oh, Father, I thank you that you hear me all the time. Thank you because you have hidden these things from, from those who consider themselves wise and you revealed it to base. Oh, Father, he's always calling the Father. And he says the, the Son did nothing except what he has seen the Father do. But in our own time, I take authority, I bind, I lose. Question is, are you really binding? You're sitting down on your chair or laying down on the bed and you're saying, I bind. How are you really binding? Do you see anything being bound just by saying it? No. Even if you go back to people that the Holy Spirit, you know, uh, moved to do things. Ezekiel, son of man, can these bones live again? <laughs> I don't know. Okay, Ezekiel could have taken and said, yeah, Holy Spirit, take the back seat. But bones come alive. Bones come alive. Nothing would have happened that day. He says, I don't know, but you know. It's okay. Prophesy. Say to the wind, oh my God. That is what you call divinely conferred authority. Say to the wind, blow on these dry bones. See that? And they said, and then I prophesied as I was commanded. That is prayer. Inspired prayer. Spirit inspired prayer. Not flesh motivated prayers. They proposed and then they wanted God to come and rubber stamp it. And then the worst part, the last part, in the usual haste, not even waiting on the Lord to even do what they said he should do, they went ahead and sealed it, sealed the deal by casting their lots. I thought they just said, Lord, show us which of these two you have chosen. But they didn't wait for the Lord to show or to even make any input at all. They just went ahead and cast lots. And by the way, where did they find that from? Ancient traditions of, of the elders. Jesus never did that. Jesus never told them, okay, guys, if you want to find the will of God, cast lots. Jesus never, where did they get that from? So you can see these old prayers were all self-motivated, rooted in tradition and human reasoning and self-imposed authority. And then we wonder why the Holy Spirit goes completely silent on us. I mean, what do you want the Holy Spirit to say? You've taken, you, you are the Lord, you are in charge, you're doing the whole thing. What would the Holy Spirit say? And the Holy Spirit didn't say nothing to this also. As a matter of fact, when he came in Acts chapter 2, he didn't even talk about it. <laughs> he didn't even go there. He just went ahead and did the will of God. Saints of God, the Holy Spirit will always do the will of God, not your will, not your wish. And I dare say to you, uh, and I'm going to say this, uh, you receive it if you want. If you don't, don't receive it. But I'm telling you, some of these things are critical. When you see ministers of God who say, I don't have to pray in Jesus' name. I don't have to have faith. The anointing on me, if I call anything, it will be done. Because I'm a man of God. You better run. You better run, child of God. Because you don't know who is behind that. Like we saw one, my wife and I recently, and I'm not going to mention, <laughs> mention names, and just listening, we quickly switched the channel. Quickly. Because we could sense a, 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 a spirit that was not of God, of Christ, was coming into the atmosphere. So, ah, no, this is not of God. And we're like, whoa. And yet the people can discern, the people can hear it. So you better watch it. So who is Lord? Who is in charge? Jesus Christ said it is sufficient that the servant becomes like the master, but the servant cannot be above the master. So when you come thumping your chest and doing all of that, you better watch it. And you, child of God, you better watch where you're going and who, who you're listening to and who is laying hands on you. But anyway, we must understand and we must come to terms with this truth. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth, number one. Let me quickly let us remember that this is the first description that was given about the Holy Spirit. It was not first called the spirit of tongues. It was not first called the spirit of power. 
he was not first called the spirit of anything else you want to say. The first description that the Lord Jesus Christ gave concerning the Holy Spirit is that he is the spirit of truth. So the first thing you want to let to guide you is truth. As a matter of fact, a lot of debates we argue over uh, in today's world can actually be resolved if we were governed by the spirit of truth. Not what I want, not what I desire, not what will make me happy, not what will please me or what the people want, but truth, what is true. And Paul came to that place in Philippians chapter 4. Whatsoever things are true, first and foremost. Because once you take the first step and it's a step in falsehood, it's doubtful that anything else you're doing is of God. The spirit of Christ is the spirit of truth. You got to first establish truth. And that's why I say, in fact, just opening our mouths and praying is not the first thing. Establish truth. What is true about this matter? What is the truth concerning this? Is Christ in this? Is this what God wants us to do? What is true here? When you establish truth, then you can proceed with that. But also, the spirit of Christ comes to glorify Jesus Christ. Jesus told us he will glorify me. He will not speak of himself. He will glorify me. Now think about it. Why do you think the Holy Spirit will glorify you? Glorify yourself. Glorify your need. Glorify your emotion. Glorify your desire. Glorify your ambition. Glorify whatever it is you want. Why do you think he will do that? So once yourself is on, enthroned, once it's your ambition, once it's your desire, or what pleases flesh, or what the world wants, or what the people want, don't forget Saul, the people is the people is the people. Don't forget Aaron, the people, the people. The Holy Spirit doesn't do that. The Holy Spirit comes to glorify Jesus. The Holy Spirit comes to glorify Jesus. And you say, oh, can God do without the people? Oh, my goodness. You better believe it. Noah's ark was only eight out of the entire world. Even Jesus hanging on the cross, it was just him himself. His disciples fled and left him. And he himself said, even if you all forsake me, the one who sent me has not forsaken me. So, so if the whole world goes to one side and Jesus stands on one side, where do you think the Holy Spirit is going to go? <laughs> so Jesus, I'll see you later. I want to go with the people. No, the Holy Spirit will go with Jesus. He's, he was sent to glorify Jesus. So if what you are doing is not glorifying Jesus, it is almost certain it is not the Holy Spirit doing it. These are signs. These are ways to know. But also, we must come to terms with the fact, child of God, the Holy Spirit is the one in charge. He is the administrator of the kingdom of God. He's not your houseboy. He's not your messenger. He's not your errand spirit. That Go here, Holy Spirit. Come back, Holy Spirit. Do this, Holy Spirit. No, he is in charge. He is in charge. He is not, he is not an errand boy, you know, just there to do your wishes. No. So when you see men of God acting like the Holy Spirit is their errand boy, you better run for your life. The Holy Spirit is in charge. Look for the fruit of humility of Christ in the people of God, in ministers of God. So the, when the Holy Spirit showed up in the book of Acts, what did he do? He literally took over. He didn't come to serve their purpose. He didn't come to, okay, Simon, what do you want today? No. Oh, Simon, I, I heard what you were saying the other time. Okay, let's go with what you said. No, he, he just brushed all that to the side, took over and enforced the agenda of Christ, enforced the will of God, because that's what he comes to do. And this for us, child of God, is the pattern. And don't forget what God told Moses, see to it that you build according to the pattern. If I told him multiple times, see to it that you build according to the pattern. I say to us, ministers of God, see to it that you're building according to the pattern that is laid for us. The Holy Spirit is in charge. He doesn't come to serve our purpose. The good news is that the disciples didn't argue with the Holy Spirit. Some of us still argue with the Holy Spirit today. They didn't argue. Instead, they yielded themselves and they followed his leadership. They yielded themselves and they followed his leadership. And I think we must also do the same. And that child of God is truly the first Holy Spirit inspired pattern prayer that we find in the book of Acts. That is the one, the first one that the Holy Spirit inspired. And let's remember saints of God, these things were written for our example. These things were written for our example. And we will do well to pay close attention 
to them. We're going to be praying that first prayer. And what we're going to be doing in this whole series is taking prayers from the book of Acts and then we, we reenact them and pray them in our time. So what is that first prayer again? It's there in Acts 2, from verse 2 to 4. The Bible says, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house, which also tells you he took charge. He took over. He filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. They all began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Oh, Holy Spirit, we yield to you. Precious Holy Spirit, we acknowledge you as the administrator. We acknowledge you as the one who is in charge. We set aside our flesh, our opinions, human reasoning, our impulsive nature, our desire to be seen, our desire to be heard, our desire to be upfront. We set it aside. For it is none, we want to come to that place where we can truly say, none of flesh in us, but all of you in us. Yes, Lord, like, like, like John would say, that he might increase and that we would decrease. And let me quickly correct something there. It doesn't mean you decrease so that he can increase. That's not what John was saying. So it's not your decreasing that makes him increase. No, he says he must increase. So it's a determined factor. It's a determined conclusion that the Holy Spirit must increase. Christ must increase, but I must decrease. So we take our place, which is to humble ourselves before you, Holy Spirit. And we begin to pray as we see this pattern in Acts chapter 2, that Holy Spirit, you will feel our environments, feel our churches, feel our homes, feel our gatherings with the sound of heaven. Oh, that we might hear the sound of heaven, oh God. We've heard too much sound from planet Earth. We've heard too much sound from people. We've heard too much sound from the flesh. We've heard too much sound from our senses. But now we want to hear the sound that comes from heaven. And Holy Spirit, we begin to posture ourselves in such a way to receive sounds of heaven. Sounds of heaven. Sounds of heaven that will permeate the atmosphere. Sounds of heaven that will cause a hush and sound. Sounds of heaven that will drown the multiple sounds of planet Earth. Sounds of heaven that will drown the sounds of demons. Sounds of heaven that will shut the mouths of lions. Sounds of heaven that will drown the sounds of principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world and those of spiritual weaknesses in high places, sounds of heaven that will drown even the sound of our flesh, sounds of heaven that will silence even our fears, sounds of heaven that will drown our unbelief, that will drown our distrust, mistrust, our fears, oh God, sounds of heaven that will eradicate and lift us up from the place of timidity, from the place of, 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 of total fear, from the place of captivity, and bring us to the place where we are attentive to you. And then Holy Spirit begin to activate visions of God, activate cloven tongues of fire, reveal yourself, part yourself in us, feel us, feel your people, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, people in church, oh God, Everyone, it says that we're all filled. And so we begin to pray that all of your people will be filled. No more excuses. No more hiding from the truth. No more making of excuses, denominational excuses, doctrinal excuses, human excuses, fleshly excuses. But that all your people will begin to come to the place of divine encounter with the Holy Spirit. We all will be filled with the Spirit. 
filled with you, Holy Spirit. I pray for my brothers and sisters, those who are under the sound of my voice, and those who will listen and watch this recording in time to come, especially those who are not yet filled with the Holy Spirit. I begin to pray that you receive the infilling of the Spirit. You receive the touch of the Spirit of God. Be filled with the Holy Spirit from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Let it come and take over your life and begin to inspire utterance of the Spirit that will begin to declare Spirit-inspired utterances, that the words that proceed out of our mouths will be inspired by the Spirit, our thought life inspired by the Spirit, our prayer lives inspired by the Spirit. This is where it all begins. It begins with you, Holy Spirit. True prayers in the kingdom begins with you, Holy Spirit. So we give you that first place. We acknowledge you, Holy Spirit. We give you that place of priority. For without you, we can do absolutely nothing. Our prayers are worthless. They are rooted in tradition. They are rooted in self. They are rooted in worldly events. They are rooted in our fears. They are rooted in unbelief. If it's not inspired by the Spirit, they are rooted in our fear of death. They are rooted in our fear of demons. They are rooted in our fear of the unknown. They are rooted in our fear of, of the future. They are rooted in our fear of, of possible outcomes. But we don't want to pray from there anymore. We want to pray from the place of inspiration of the Spirit. And so Holy Spirit will give you that place of priority that you will take us over, that you will feel us and begin to teach us to pray even in heaven's language. Begin to teach us to pray even in the language that you inspire beyond just our own human language. We receive the language of the Spirit. We receive the utterance of the Spirit that we might pray from that perspective. And we thank you. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for accomplishing this for us. Amen. Amen and amen and amen. We want to say thank you all so much. Uh, we, we hope that you are blessed by the word, even as we have been blessed. Until we come your way again, not too long from now, stay elevated. And don't forget, uh, set your calendar, uh, December 31st, our prophetic watch service. We love you all. God bless you. Bye-bye now.